Hello and welcome back to So You Want to Start a Business. I'm your host, Ingrid Thompson. These podcasts are a collection of interviews with business owners, entrepreneurs and other smart guests so you can learn tactics, tips and strategies to implement in your business. If you're listening anywhere other than my website, you can find transcripts of all the podcasts at my blog, healthynumbers.com.au. It's never been easier to go from having an idea to actually starting a business of your own. Are you ready to meet today's guest? Today we meet Anna Louise Howard, who is the founder of All Mine, a slow fashion brand. All Mine was founded to solve a problem that most of us women have faced when clothes shopping. Fits one part of the body and not the other. Anna Louise has created a unique sizing system that has taken years to perfect, and she is here today to share her business startup story. Let's go. Hello, and here we are today with Anna Louise Howard. And hello, Anna Louise. Hi, Ingrid. How are you? Um, and good. hi, everyone listening. Hi, everyone listening. Indeed. Thank you. So, Anna Louise, let's just jump right in. What business are you in? What is your business? Uh, Ingrid, my business is called All Mine. It's in the fashion space and it provides great fitting women's fashion using a unique design to fit model. Uh, This means we use bust, waist and height measurements in one garment at the convenience of ready to wear, meaning it's it's a tailored solution without waiting for a tailored garment, um, also without the cost of bespoke clothing. Wow, it's so amazing, Anna Louise. It really is Now, when did you start this business? Okay, so I came up with the idea around uh, 2007, 2008, and I started looking at what else was in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. I officially launched in 2013 through a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, I then took two years off in 2014, 15 due to uh, unavoidable personal life disruption. And then I restarted uh, last year in May. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's had a bit of a, it's been a while, but um, you're it's absolutely... It's had a bit of a rocky start. <laughs> it yeah, has. But it, it's, um, it's been good because it's given me time to refine and yes. to re, re, um, reassess where it's going. Yes. And why did you start the business? What was your motivation for getting this business started? Uh, well, uh, the short version, I had lots of issues finding suitable clothing that fitted me and I knew I wasn't alone. So I did some research and found that it was a common problem and knew that I wanted to create a business that was the solution. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a small frame, a large bust and I'm quite short and I know I don't fit a lot of standard sizing. Mm-hmm. So I set out to find how I could solve this problem for me and for those like me. At the same time, I actually found out there's ladies with the opposite problem that had similar trouble in finding clothes that fitted. Mm. So often we hear this story, don't we, about a business starts because the, the person who gets it started can't find what they need and it grows from there. Terrific. Yeah. So what did you want, apart from something that fitted you, so clearly you were making your own clothes, but what did you actually want from the business from day one? Um, look, what I wanted from day one and what I still want now is to continually help and support business women that want to buy clothing that makes them look and feel great just the way they are. Um, I want women to be able to buy great quality clothing that isn't going to date in a month or two, which is where our slow fashion ethos comes in. Um, Buying beautiful clothing can get very expensive and Mm. then the cost of time and money to get it tailored can be really frustrating and often becomes out of reach for most working women. Mm. I wanted to be that solution and I wanted to provide convenient, affordable, tailored fashion and I, I... I want to continually do that every day. That's, it's, I'm, I just want one. I want all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, Anna Louise, when did you actually realise you were in business? Because quite often, you know, there's a point where we go, okay, it's real now. What was that point for you? <laughs> well, as I'd run a business before, I knew it would be the first official sale. Mm-hmm. So, at the time, everything was focused in getting that first sale. And yes, as most business owners will tell you, uh, they know who their first customer is. And the difference for me that there were two first customers as I had the relaunch last year. So I was lucky in that fact that I got to have that lovely experience twice. Oh, that's so lovely, isn't it? Yeah, so those first sales are very precious, aren't they? That, that first person that commits to whatever yeah. it is, it, it's pretty special. 
So you've talked about the fact that you were, I mean, I've met you and I don't think there's anything particularly strange about your shape and size, but you couldn't find what you wanted. So I usually ask people, how do you know that the business is something that other customers want? So how did you know it was viable, that you had a viable business? How did you know your customers will pay for this product and service? What, how did you come to that conclusion that you weren't alone That's in That's a good question. Yeah. Um, because it is one thing to have a great idea mm. um, and another to obviously make it profitable. Mm. Um, I did a crowdfunding soft launch to just mm. see how much demand there was for both the product and the concept. Um, the amount of interest was incredible. Mm. I knew it was vi- viable when I spoke to customers and I got amazing feedback on the idea. I also did farmer's markets to provide proof of concept and I did have to pivot on two fronts and move closer to my target customer. I'm now focused on building new products to service that demand. So in that, you know, I think... Startups have that lovely ability to be agile Mm. and I really took that um, second uh, relaunch to to take that agility move and to pivot. Mm. Could you just explain, because maybe not everybody listening would understand what you mean there when you say about agile and pivot. Could you talk a little bit more about that, please? Um, Okay, so when you're uh, looking at... um, an MVP, what they call minimum viable product, you can uh, you assess it after the fact of, of how did it go, how was it received, um, what you can take away from the feedback that was given mm. and how you can do it better mm-hmm. or, or change tact, which is exactly the, the idea of pivoting is, is like a boat, you, you, yep. you change tack. Um, so for me, I, I really had to sit down and go, okay, the idea was great. Mm. Um, it was the execution. I had uh, manufacturing issues. Mm. I had a lot of um, research and development that had gone into actually the, the, the innovative side of the business, mm. but applying that to, to the actual garments themselves um, meant that I couldn't just take any design and make it work. It actually mm. had to be engineered mm. to take that design, to take that um, that that size system into account while designing. So that agility of being able to do that um, was really important in order to actually be able to relaunch. Mm. Um, so it was it definitely it's it's that that smart um, you know small steps that are measurable and achievable to make sure that you know you can you can actually create that product and make it make it work as a business and you know Anna Louise it's very brave of you to be able to see that and make that pivot or that changing tact because we so often see somebody who's so in love with their own idea that they don't actually um, they can't see that when it's coming towards them from the customer um, you know, so very brave of you to be able to listen to what your customers were saying and then be able to make those changes, you know, that, that then accommodates, you know, the ultimate uh, prov- provision of a product for, your, for the clients. I think that's one of the major things of being successful in any business is mm. actually being able to listen to the customer's mm. wants and needs mm. and being able to tailor your product <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> but um, literally, um, you know, really work with your product yeah. to meet those demands and, and meet those wants and needs. Yeah. And I think that's that's ultimately where the success of the business will come from mm. if you can if you can fulfil those desires of the customer. Mm. I, I think you're absolutely right. So um, talk about money, um, and you can answer this with as much um, information. <laughs> I mean, money's you know, money's money. Money's you need money. it to run a business. It, and it really is a means of exchange, and we need enough of it to. But how did you fund the business in the early days, and then how did you fund expansion? How do you how do you, how are you growing? You know, where's money coming from? Well, I, I run a very lean business model. Terrific. I funded originally through a couple of personal loans, mm-hmm. but I did make sure that um, it's, oh, I can't tell you how easy it is to subscribe to different services and mm. things. Um, and what I do and, and I constantly do is actually recheck every three months 
where can I cut costs? Mm. And that has has kept the budget very constrained but main, main, meant that I can keep everything afloat. Mm-hmm. Um, and now I'm looking to refinance and expand to bigger premises and develop new product lines and hopefully um, officially move into the growth phase of the business, which I still feel like I'm still in, in proof of concept, which is quite unusual being four years in. Well, and, and I guess being fashion, you know, that proof of concept goes on for quite some time, doesn't it? Well, I think most fashion houses will do proof of concept every every time they release a range or a collection, which is is you know can be very daunting if it doesn't go well. Mm. And I think that's where my slow fashion business model that mm. I'm doing is um, a much better model for sustainability of the business. Mm. And you're talking classics as well, aren't you? In terms, yeah, of, you know, classic those classic staples. Pieces. Um, mm. And and very, um, I, I'm more onto the minimalist um, side of, of things, and mm. um, you know, choosing classic pieces that will, uh, you know, still be able to be worn in three months and not go out of date so quickly, and mm. and those kind of things. You know, I really want to be able to provide women with quality clothing they can wear season after season. Yeah, and that's those classic colours, the classic lines, that kind of thing. Yeah. So let's think about your customers. How do you find new customers? How do you know where they are? How do you know who they are? What what, what have (laughs) Um, you done about your customers? My uh, my customers actually seem to find me. I've been quite lucky. Mm -hmm. Um, I either know them or they've been referred to to me by people I know, which are the best type of customers to have. Mm-hmm. I love it. I get to talk to them. I get to provide a really personalized service. Um, cold marketing, although providing many leads, it really hasn't resulted in a lot of conversions. Just mm. for my particular business model, though, um, mm. it's been a learning curve, definitely with um, testing different methods of communication. And honestly, it's an ongoing conversation between mm. the business and my customer. And I think the most important thing is keeping that line of communication open with your customers. Mm. And, and you know, then they tell their friends and then they mm. tell their friends. Mm. I think that's the best kind of customers to try and get and retain. Yep. And, and that word of mouth um, just develops trust so quickly, doesn't it, for... Um, any time we're given word of mouth referrals, we immediately our trust in that that whoever it is, the provider, whether it's um, someone making clothing or whether it's a florist or whether it's a dentist, you know, their trust goes up enormously when we have that word of mouth referral. Yes, it does. So let's talk um, about the prices. Uh, and now, again, you don't have to talk about exactly how much you charge, but how do you decide on a pricing strategy for something as bespoke as this? How do you go about figuring <laughs> that out? <laughs> well, uh, that that's a good question, and it has been hard. Um, the pricing of all my products are roughly industry standard for markup and mm-hmm. return on investment. Mm-hmm. But I did have to change this to include Australia wide shipping. Um, mm. Online purchasing and shipping has become a, a big sticking point with people, so I've actually had to absorb. Um, the free shipping on my mm. products. Mm. Um, I do try and keep the prices as low as possible to make my pro- my products accessible um, to obviously the busy working women that are trying to make ends meet week in and week out. That's mm. that's my customer, and I know that um, you know what they they're able to spend and what they do spend on their clothing. So I try and actually cater for for that price structure from the outset of, of design and, mm. and products that I use. Oh, terrific. Um, here's a, I know you're only still getting started, but do you have an exit strategy? Um, yeah, well, when I started this, it was um, uh, originally I wanted it to be a legacy business. Um, I knew when I started that it was a 20-year plan mm-hmm. and um, a, a business coach that I had almost fell over backwards and he said, I don't think I've ever had someone come to me and say, hey, I've got a 20-year business plan. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and uh, although I would have loved to have had a daughter to hand it down to, I think um, I'll continue to work into the in the business until I find someone that I think will take it over with the love and passion I have for it. Mm. But ultimately, I want to change the way people shop for clothing. Mm. So... It's whether or not I succeed at that task because that's that's overarching. That's that's bigger than 
than just selling clothing. Yes, it's it's changing the way that people actually approach the purchase of clothing and, mm-hmm. and how they think about how they look in what they wear. Mm. And, and also that the the life of that piece mm. of clothing, mm. you know, quality and longevity of, of fashion mm. um, from a sustainable point of view, from, you know, producing producing garments, not fast fashion, but, you know, mm. to, to stand the test of time and what happens to it after. Yes, indeed. What does happen to it afterwards? Because I remember hearing um, some time ago that there was a whole lot of T-shirts that were, they were made of cotton but they couldn't actually be um, dug back into landfill because the thread that was used to sew them was such a nylon or polyester thread that it actually would have been destructive to the environment so it's you know how do we make an entire garment that actually then can act not that you want your garments to be back in landfill but you know it's it's the total of the um you know the impact on the earth as we make it as we source the fabrics as we source the buttons and the other parts you know where Mm. does all of that come from Mm. well um that's where i source all natural products Mm -hmm. um so i use um cotton cashmere tensile um Mm. and and other um other blends of fabric that that are using natural fibers so that um, you know, they, they will break down eventually and, mm. and they won't be sort of toxic to the environment. Uh, the dyeing process that mm. I um, speak to my fabric suppliers, I try and go for vegetable dye. Personally, I'm actually allergic to soy, so that makes mm. um, getting fabric that isn't dyed with soy a bit difficult. So I look for other vegetable dyes. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm always on the lookout for sustainable um, products and technologies that really you know are environmentally conscious terrific gosh it's um so much more complicated it's so much so much more complex than it appears than when you just go and buy a dress or a blouse off the rack isn't it well i don't know whether every business has this kind of depth but uh, this is my business and and my baby and i I really want to um, you know, my, my previous background in environmental photography has sort of led that whole um, mm. whole perspective that I, I do want this business to have uh, an environmental conscious. And it sounds like it definitely does. So if we go back those four years, two years, like wherever you want to go, is there anything that you wish you'd done differently at the beginning? Okay, so I will say yes, <laughs> and I think there's a lot of business owners that would. Yeah. Um, maybe to do a much smaller, minimal vial pr- product. Mm. Um, as it is, my sizing system is 45 garments, 45 pieces, mm. um, and, and that's very difficult. Um, the good thing is that obviously I have a lot longer to sell those particular garments. Um, but also doing everything myself at first and maybe not trust other people so much. Uh, I got a bit burnt in 2013, which got, you know, cost me a lot. But I've, I've now put that down to a learning experience and I've become very hands-on in every facet of the business to make sure that everything is running how I envisaged it. That's terrific. Um, yeah, those costly learning experiences can really knock us sideways, can't they? And yeah, and I yeah. mean, your clients would know, you know, there's, mm. there's that whole finance is, you know, very important part to the success of the business. So, mm. um, you know, that's, that's very important to make sure that, you know, you can maybe, you know, try and do as much of, of every facet of the business as possible at first. Mm. Um, yeah. And they, that way you know what's going on. Now, this is a slightly different question, but what do you wish you'd known from the start? So if somebody could have said to you, here's a piece of information, what would that be? Okay, so for anyone that's listening, um, (laughs) a lot more cash up front. Mm, mm. (laughs) Um, I think I wish it had known that how how much it really takes to produce an innovative product and how much Mm. research and development costs. Um, you know, getting various fabrics, different prototypes. I mean, I went through 70 prototypes mm. um, just to get one that sort of worked and that was just eye-opening in itself. 
um, and also have enough cash to keep myself comfortable during that process. Mm. There's nothing worse than than being immersed in your business and not having the funds to go, okay, the bills are sorted, mm. um, you know, just, just focus on it. Um, and and in my particular case, slow fashion is an expensive business model mm. and not something to run into quickly. So if you are thinking about slow fashion, um, really do your numbers and probably – you know, not sink too much money also into AdWords or Facebook advertising mm. before doing a lot of research. Um, I think that was one of the things that I really um, thought would help gain traction um, that, that sort of didn't. It kind of fell and I'm talking, you know, this is over a course of, of quite a while. It, it really didn't and I sunk a lot of cash into um, that side of the business and into the marketing on, but without without having too much knowledge of all of that. So maybe mm. bringing someone on board when you know, mm. uh, when you want to start, and and doing doing a lot more a lot more on less, mm. um, and also obviously as I said, just having a lot more cash up front. <laughs> that means yeah, saving is never yes yeah, <laughs> never hurts, does it? So. Um, who apart from yourself has been of the greatest assistance to you? And again, you know, whether you mention names or just mention who they were as a kind of persona, um, who's been of greatest help to you and to your business? Well, I haven't had anyone really um, sort of been involved in the business. Mm. I've I have, I have had a couple of sideline supporters and friends, mm. but it's really been a self-driven enterprise. If I didn't wholeheartedly believe in the USP and the business ethos, then I probably wouldn't be doing it. Mm. I really think as a business owner, you have to love what you do in order for you to really make it a success. Mm. It's that love and passion that gets you through those inevitably low points, mm. but definitely make sure that you've got supporters on the side to share the highs mm. with too. Mm. Um, so in that sense, I really haven't had, um, and, and I also last year was was very isolated in southern New South Wales. Mm. Um, I, I sort of, you know, really put my head down and tried to nut the business out by myself. So, yeah. Mm. In a, and so you were physically isolated and not, not around people that were able to actually help you in that. So it's, it's an interesting model to go completely on your own. But that, that notion of self-motivation is so incredibly important because even if you have great people around you, you still, you're the one that still has to get up every day and do something, isn't it? Exactly, and mm. and no one's going to motivate you unless mm. you're motivated mm. to do it yourself. And you know, I am definitely not going to say that's easy. Um, mm. You know, there have been days where I'm like, I do not want to get out of bed. This is just all too hard. Mm. And you know, I've um, one of the good things was I did set aside a separate workspace mm. um, to make sure that that was my office and that's where I go to work and. I push myself every day and I still push myself every day mm -hmm. and I think every business owner has to keep pushing themselves in order to grow their business and in order to, to succeed on a, on a daily basis. Mm. That's, um, yeah, it's so important, isn't it, to be able to keep going when you just want to stay under the doona or go and have coffee with a friend or something like that. Mm. Or even even if sales are going well, you know, mm. you can't sort of rest on your laurels. Mm. You've got to sort of go, okay, well, how do I make things better or, mm. or bigger or different or, you know, how can I help my customers even more? Mm. That's right. That's a, it, Just success doesn't stay that way unless you're actually continuously growing and in, innovating and changing. Yeah. So you've talked, um, because my next question is about who gives you good and useful feedback, and I know you've already talked about customers and listening to them, so I'm, you know, you've indicated that they are good for feedback, and you've said that there isn't really, you know, other people that have been of good assistance. How, how do you get feedback about what's happening? How do you know what's going on? Hmm. Well, uh Gosh, I, 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 my customers, as I said, my customers are really my useful feedback. Mm. I talk to them at every opportunity and ask them what they think about the designs, fabrics, finishes, mm -hmm. what they want, what they need to get by. Mm -hmm. um, aside from my customers, um, hmm, 
That's a really good question. <laughs> I'm a bit stuck. That's okay. Um, Customers are I a great think, place to get I mean, feedback, get, yeah. Other business owners um, mm. have been really good. Uh, I, you know, I do go to quite a few events and, you know, we get talking about different things and, you know, there's definitely um, value in, uh, in talking to other business owners and being part of a, a wider community, which, you know, exactly what this podcast is, um, having that, that loop back into um, getting feedback is also really important. So I think, you know, putting yourself out there and, and asking for it. Mm. And then listening to it, as you say, being able to really listen to what people say. Mm. Mm. So knowing that there are a number of people listening to this podcast who are possibly thinking about starting a business or in the early planning stages, what would be the one thing that you would tell them, recommend, suggest to anyone? <laughs> and you've alluded <laughs> one to thing, some of it Only already. one thing? Oh, <laughs> gosh, Ingrid. <laughs> well, you've talked already about cash, so you've already used that one up. So yeah, the, yeah, so... Yeah. Um, What's Gosh, the uh, the hundred percent contingency fund would definitely mm. be mm. Uh, the priority. But often, I know that's not realistic for most business owners. But definitely, my recommendation. Um, I would say the ability to plan and execute the product or service on your own before outsourcing, yes. and that doesn't really matter what product or service it is. If you know enough about that product and service to execute it yourself, then you'll know what it, what needs to be done. Um, I think you really need to understand all the moving parts to be able to direct people once you do get to that point. Um, just a way to keep your initial costs down while you build your client base. Also, get your marketing in place before launch. Create an event. Um, do lots of pre, pre-startup um, activities. Mm. And you can never do enough. And... That's something I would have loved to have done a lot more of looking back and definitely something I'll be doing a lot of in the future. Mm, that, and I think the, the beautiful example is Apple or, you know, cinemas that, you know, they, we see trailers for movies long before they come out. Apple yep. tells us about products long before they, they tease us with what's coming. And I think there's such a big lesson in that. That's very, um, very astute to add that as one of those things is that I think often people kind of keep their idea under a bushel and then they, ta-da, launch. But in fact, you know, sharing that and creating an expectation is so much more powerful. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Now you, Anna Louise, <laughs> you've alluded to, again some <laughs> of the answers to this. What are the three characteristics that you think makes you successful in your business? Now, I'm, I'm already thinking of some of them for you, but I want to hear you say them. Um, okay, obviously determination. I think every business owner has got to be determined. Yeah. Um, genuine love of what you're doing mm. and producing. The ability to multitask, but more mm. than anything else, I think the priority is the ability to deliver. Mm. I think there are plenty of people out there with ideas and they're probably listening to this right now, mm. but they just fail to execute those ideas. And I think you've really got to have that vision and have that vision so clear that you can execute it and not just execute it, but execute it well mm. and be quality and, and deliver it that uh, exceeds the expectations of your customers. I think that's that's that huge characteristic that really distinguishes people that say, oh, I've got this idea and I want to do this, to those that say, hey, I have a business and this is what I do. Mm. Mm. The ability to execute. I think that's the biggest characteristics. And then after that, obviously, multitask and then obviously mm -hmm. love what you're doing yeah. and then determine to make that happen. Yeah. And I think all of those become the recipe for success. Well, my goodness, and, and this is why so few businesses really become truly successful, isn't it? Because, you know, with all of these sorts of characteristics, it takes a lot to be that person, doesn't it? Mm. It does. <laughs> it can, I mean, they, I'm not, it's, it's, it's hard. There's, yeah. there's tears, there's laughter, there's, you know, the whole sons and daughters going on, <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> you know, but it's... Um, uh, for those that don't know what that is, you're going to have to Google it. But um, there's, you know, it is. It, it, it's, um, it's a process and, you know, there's no one set formula, but there's definitely um, characteristics that 
are inherent in most business owners because mm. that's what it takes to succeed. Mm. And that's that's sort of my final question is the characteristics that are essential for a budding startup. So how would you summarise those just there at the end for everybody listening? Um, characteristics for a budding startup? Yeah, so someone who's listening and thinking about it, how do they go from, you know, t- what do they need in themselves to um, to go from a budding thinking about it to actually doing something? Okay, so I think they need to be really clear um, as far as a startup goes, I think it needs to be an innovative solution to a problem if it's a product or if it's a service that your service provides an exceptional expertise or, or mm. value compared to your competitors. Um, and maybe maybe the best question that listeners can ask themselves is, is your USP or your reason for starting your business strong enough to weather the startup storm? Mm. Yeah, because that's, you're right, it is a storm, isn't it? Mm. Well, it's, you know, you set that, that if it's a boat, you set the, <laughs> the boat up and you put it in the water and you put the sails up, but there's always going to be bad weather ahead mm. and it's just whether or not you can you can hold on and you can get through the other side and mm. you know it's not all going to be smooth sailing and and I think if you've got that realistic perspective mm. and that you you completely believe in what you're doing is servicing a a, a, a genuine um, need and want in the market that that you will succeed and, and to everyone that is considering, you know, I do wish you all the luck and, um, you know, I love, I love these podcasts, Ingrid, and I, I, think, oh, it's, um, I think it's wonderful to, to foster um, the startups um, and, you know, I think if you've got that USP, you've got that determination um, that, that you will. Well, that's a lovely note to finish on, Anna Louise. Thank you so much. Um, It's been (laughs) delightful listening to you and can't wait to see all mine clothing absolutely everywhere. So, um... Oh, wonderful. (laughs) Thank you so much, Ingrid, and uh, really appreciate it. Hey, if you're listening to this podcast, chances are you have a great idea for your own business startup. We understand you're keen to put the time and energy to take your idea and make it real. You may want to go back and listen to some parts of this interview with Anna Louise because she really has shared some wonderful insights about getting started in business. You may prefer to read a transcript of the interview. It's available at my blog at healthynumbers.com.au. And on the Healthy Numbers website, there's a ton of other resources. You may like to take the startup readiness quiz. Remember, ideas are great. Ideas on their own, well, they're just that. They're just ideas. What are you going to do right now to take action on your idea for your own business? Thanks for listening.